Hey Flosstube, this is Kim aka Spartan Stitcher on Instagram and today is the 2nd of November, 2nd of November 2020. This is video number 93. We're here to talk about my weekly cross stitching progress. We're in a Michigan State shirt of course because the Spartans beat U of M this past weekend so all is good in the world of uh, you know college football. So I worked on five different pieces this week. So let's get to it. First thing is I finished up my uh, week on uh, Out of the Stash at Last, week four, on this Heart of Chocolates by Jeff Jolseth. I think I got one or two more chocolates done. Again, I have not put in any of the back stitching, only a little bit of the Krynik, and Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, so I got a week's worth of chocolates. There you go. So they won't look like much until I put on the, the finishing touches, but I'm going to do all the stitching first. So there you have seven chocolates, and all that pink is all fractionals. I think there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's like eight full full crosses here, like full size stitches, and the rest of it's all fractionals. So again, very fussy piece, but it's gonna look great when it's done. And that is twenty eight count um, Jovelin, I believe, antique white. And the next thing is I caught up on the 52 weeks of black work sale by peppermint purple this is a free stitch along on facebook so there's the entire thing i did that uh bottom row of five blocks so that was weeks 39 through 43 and we only have two more rows remaining so it was very fitting to work on this close to halloween when I've chosen all Halloween colors, and this is 32 count, um, I think this is Lugana, or is it Jovelin, in um, Cauldron Bubble by Color Cotton. So, and there is the newest row closer up. third piece I worked on was Kindred Spirits, full coverage uh, by Jody Bergsma, and I managed to get my page done, so second page of the month for October, uh, brings my, um, so this week alone on it, I put in 2,900 tent stitches, I believe I'm over 10,000 tent stitches for the month on it. And I'm currently at 15% complete. Uh, the whole pattern is 450 by 600. I forgot. Somebody asked me on Instagram too. I have to go back. Somebody asked me how many pages total there are. Um, I'm going to have to go and look. But it's 450 by 600. And I have now five pages complete. So two of the pages were done at the beginning of the year. And I've done three pages. I don't want to. I don't want to unroll the whole bottom, but there you go. So three pages on the top row, two pages on the second row, and then in December I'll pick this one back up for around the world, uh, going to the United States because Jody is an American, and I will work on getting a page, that first page on the third row, done which is all of the gray horse. So let me bring this closer. I can't see what you're seeing. There you go. This is 25 count, easy count. And there's your five pages, 15% complete. I have this one taken apart, not only so I could show you, but because I use the sidebars on something else I'm going to work on this week. And then, um, so I finished that page on 
uh, Halloween Eve, if you will, so the 30th of October. And so I had one day left in October. I'm like, well, what do I work on? Something Halloween, of course. So I pulled out Witchy Tea Time by the Primitive Hair. This is in the 2014 uh, Just Cross Stitch Halloween issue. And I had a busy Halloween day. Um, but I did manage to put in 500 stitches. Um, sorry, you can see through the, the linen. This is, um, is it 20 count? I don't remember. Um, but it's Salem by Color and Cotton is, is the colorway. So what I did is more of the table and I did the entire cake. So I stitched a treat on Halloween. So 500 stitches to get that cake and the table, um, hold it this way so you can see. So I had the table right up until where the cake stand started. So I started on the cake first and I stitched the entire cake and then I just did a big block of black for the table. So that is witchy tea time. Again, my goal on this one for the year was half the design. Um, so top borders complete. And I still have like to get at least half the witch done, the center witch, um, before I can safely say that the design is, my goal is met for the year. So we'll see if I get there. If I don't, it's okay. It's a goal. It's not a deadline. And then yesterday, being the 1st of November, we have our November Familiar for the Catalog of Witches Familiar Sale by Ingleside Imaginarium. And I managed to get it done all in one day. So there is the entire piece so far. That was our penultimate familiar. We only have one left. And so this one is, I would pronounce it Volpez. It might be Volps, but I like Volpez better. Um, he is the silver mutation of a red fox. So he resembles your, your regular fox, but of course all these familiars are a little bit extra. They're a little bit special. They're not just, you know, the animal they resemble. So, um, the Volpez familiar is good for witches who will be um, going between wilderness and urban areas because uh, Volpez has a keen sense of direction. So he can help you navigate through uh, the woods and the wilderness. And also, if you go back into urban areas, he won't look that out of place. And also, a fox fur. Like, if you get cold, you can cozy up right up to him. So that is Volpez. Uh, something to also state, because not everybody is perfect. Um, I started stitching him. I started on this black back side of his head, stitching from the bottom to the top. And it's, that's the only piece, you know, that's where I started the block was that, that bit of black right there. And I realized my block is too tall. Um, this entire bottom row is one stitch taller than all the rest of the box. So instead of frogging this entire bottom portion of the border, I was like, okay, I'm going to go with it and I'm going to fudge it. And so I added an extra row to the tops of his ears and I added an extra row, um, you know, about two thirds of the way down on the trees. So where their trunks were, were pretty plain, I just added an extra row. So that is Volpez or, or Volps. Mr. Fox, he's really cute. I like him. Um, again, I have no idea what will be in the final block. Um, my brain's just not working. I, I don't know what kind of, what kind of animal is left, but we only have one left. And I will have this finished for the year. Really enjoyed stitching on this one. This is 32 count Lugana in Murky by Picture This Plus. So those are the five pieces I worked on this week. 
my plans for the week. Uh, we are now in November, so I can work on the Full Coverage Fanatics events for November. For around the world, we're going to the United Kingdom. So I will be finishing my page on uh, The Summer Ball by Sandy Littlejohns. So I am on this page right here, and all I have to do is that painting, their heads, and I think one of the ladies I have to finish from her bust line up. Um, so I'll be working on that and uh, double counting those stitches, not only for, I'll use them for around the world and also for Wheel of Fortune, which is our monthly event for November. I've already started working on this today. I only have like 77 stitches in there, but I, I finished the brown on this side and I, and I carried it over into the hair. That's all I've done so far. But I wanted to show you um, where I'm started at because who knows, I might have this done by next week. It depends on my motivation and what's going on this week. More on that later. So she needs, you know, head and chest. She needs from her bust line up and head, 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 head in this painting. So I'll go one color at a time because you know, their hair colors are like four or five different colors and also go into the painting. So it'll be some cross country for me. And then once that's done, I'll, I'll do the back stitching. The other piece I'm going to be using for um, Wheel of Fortune this week is Trick or Treat. It's back on the scroll frame. So I took this off the wall yesterday and I put it back on the scroll frame starting down here in this corner and we're going to fill in the page and see some pumpkins um, so you know i have all the black done and now it's time to fill in the pages so there's where i'm starting with now let me hold this um we have a partial page so it, it's only like 30 blocks high and then there's so um, I'm going to be doing this for the uh, on the counting version for the word autumn, doing 250 stitches per letter. So that's 1,500 stitches. I have to double that for 10 stitching. So 3,000 stitches. Um, I figure I'll get that partial page done and a little bit more as I um, feather into the surrounding pages. So hopefully we'll have that done by next week too when I see you. And then I'll just keep going because I still have more full coverage goals to meet. We'll see if I can get both of these pages finished or one or the other and go from there. Um, and because it's a new month, if I need a break from these two pieces, I can pull out Templar Prophecy. I can pull out um, Big Red Ship of Life. It'll be one, one of those two pieces. Um, might make a, a third piece to work on for the week. So full coverage, maybe something else. We shall see. Uh, a couple stitching notes. Um, YouTube switched up some things in uh, their YouTube studio where you can access comments and such. Every once in a while they mark a comment as uh, likely spam and you'll be able to see it in your notifications but you can't go click on it to read the entire comment or respond to it. Um, they recently moved where that likely spam area is and I cannot find it. So um, I know there's at least one person from my last video that commented. I can only read part of her comment in, in the notifications and I cannot go reply to it. So uh, Booze Mom 11, I believe um, previously known as Amanda Panda Stitches. Sorry I wasn't able to respond to your comment. But um, I do find it funny that you. it sounds like you watch my videos with your husband. Um, just because the time they come out is, is just about bedtime for you guys there in the UK. So, um, I'm hoping that's because my Air Force stories are interesting for, for men as well. So that's cool. Uh, let's see. Any other stitching content? Full coverage year to date. So through October, I added on my stitches on Kindred Spirits, the new start on Odin and Card Sharp that I worked on, uh, last month. So now my full coverage stitches for the year 
Converting everything to full stitches is 118,566. So we'll just keep adding to that. Uh, this month I do plan on uh, putting together a little video explaining how I set my goals each year in hopes that it may help some of you to set some uh, realistic goals for yourselves. Um, mostly it's for full coverage folks, but if even if you're not um, a fanatic, if you don't stitch full coverage, you can still use the same principles to set goals on your non-full coverage pieces as well. So look out for that video. That'll be a floss tube extra. And uh, that's it for my stitching content. If that's all you're here for, um, thank you for joining me and we'll see you next week. Let's see. Um, real life a little bit. The weather has been crazy. Uh, I've talked about the fact that we had our pumpkins inside for like a week and a half because we had freezing temperatures outside and then we carved them and I figured then it was safe to put them outside. It was okay if they froze by that point because the carving was done. We, we carved them, uh, the week before Halloween, so um, like a full week before Halloween, and then the temperature warmed up again above freezing. And if you looked at my Instagram stories, I posted pictures, the tallest pumpkin fully collapsed. Like it didn't just roll over, it collapsed on itself. The second tallest pumpkin kind of has like a crushed in face. And the third pumpkin was okay, just kind of, you know, curled some of the, some of the carved facial features. What? It's North Dakota. I can never predict the weather. If I try to keep them from freezing, then it warms up later. Um, our weather has just been going back and forth, either really cold or really nice. And this week is no exception. For um, trick-or-treating on Saturday, we had a, um, it was, like the real temperature was like 40 something, but uh, we had winds gusting between 40 and 60 miles per hour, which is 64 to 96 kilometers per hour, uh, which made a wind chill of 19 degrees Fahrenheit or negative seven degrees Celsius. That is super cold to go trick or treating in. Um, and then my youngest was not able to go trick or treating. Friday at two o'clock, I got a phone call that uh, my five year old was identified as a close contact. One of her classmates in kindergarten uh, had tested positive for COVID. And so the entire class is quarantining again um, for about a week and a half this time based on the, the contact date when that student was last in school. And so I picked her up about an hour early from school on Friday. We still don't have our, our uh, packet of worksheets yet, but hopefully I'll get that uh, later today. So she will be home with me doing uh, distance learning or you know worksheets from home all of this week and half of next week, um, which she was sad about, not only because of missing trick-or-treating, but also um, winter busing started for us today. So um, <clears throat> the school is like a five or six minute brisk walk from our house. And, um, but through the winter, it's just, you know, it gets down to negative 50, we don't do that. So they contract out buses to um, go through base housing and pick up the kids and take them to school. So that gives me about an extra hour of kid-free time as, as the bus adds additional time to pick everybody up. Um, but my youngest, you know, this is her first year at the big school and she was, she's been looking forward to riding the bus since the summer started. And now she has to wait another week and a half and watch her sister get on the bus. Um, yeah, so that was tough for her this morning. Uh, the only thing they don't like is because of COVID safety measures, they are making siblings sit together and assigning them seats. Um, so, you know, you don't get to be cool. The, the th third grader doesn't get to sit in the back and, and be apart from her sister. Um, but that's, that's how it goes. So winter busting is starting. And... Yeah, so my youngest did not go trick-or-treating. Uh, my eight-year-old took you know, her trick-or-treat bag, which they both have cross-stitch bags, um, her trick-or-treat bag and her sister's and my husband uh, walked them around and she only, she only went around the block, hit up both sides of the street going around the block and then she had enough. And then she came home and helped my husband um, 
I would say pass out candy, but they didn't pass. We have a PVC like candy slide that uh, we made, and so you could um, put the candy down the, the PVC tube, and the, the kids down at the bottom could hold their, their bucket or their bag up to the end of the tube and get their candy that way. So that was pretty fun. Today, the high is 60 degrees. Uh, the highs this week is all between 62 and 67 Fahrenheit, which is between 16 and 19 degrees Celsius. Lows, 43 to 48 Fahrenheit, or 6 to 8 degrees Celsius. But then next week, we go back into, like, winter temperatures, or, you know, North Dakota winter temperatures. Um, the highs next week are 19 to 28 degrees Fahrenheit, which is negative 7 to negative 2 Celsius. Um, lows next week between 8 and 20 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 13 to negative 6 degrees Celsius. So uh, we're talking less than half. The temperature is going to be cut, um, I, I can't even say the temperature is going to be cut in half. It's going to be cut by more than half between this week and next week. So um, the fun of, you know, approaching winter in North Dakota. Now, let's see, Air Force story. I'm going to talk briefly skimming the surface on the flying hour program because it is so in-depth um, I would bore you guys trying to explain how it works but basically in the Air Force the flying hour program it's calculated annually by fiscal year and the fiscal year in the Air Force starts October 1st so um, starting October 1st you get your flying hours for the entire 12 month period so what that means is they have this these gigantic equations where they take so many different factors and they put them in and they figure out, you know, magic comes out and they, they figure out how many flying hours each base needs um, for the year. And that's how they get the money that they need, the flying hour program money. So this in this massive equation, things they take into uh, account, the Ready Air Crew Program, which is called RAP, um, to make sure that the air crew members are ready for their mission. Um, for my husband, as an experienced air crew member, he needs to fly three times a month. The inexperienced, and there's, you know, um, there's a specific definition of what makes you inexperienced versus experienced. But the inexperienced crews uh, here at Barks or here at um, North Dakota need four flights per month, so he only needs three flights per month. And um, then if you're like new to being an air crew member, then you have initial pilot training or air, air crew training, whatever. So all those requirements, they know how many um, flying hours per student and you uh, know how many students you, you normally have, how many training days you normally have per month and add that up per year. Um, for support flights, things that aren't actually training but are our flights, things like uh, the planes flying to and from depot for depot level maintenance. Um, when the planes had been broke for an extended period of time and they need a functional check flight or an operational check flight, there's no training going on with those flights, but they're still flights that need to happen. So the, um, there's a calculation to add in those flying hours. Um, the number of aircraft you have and uh, mission qualification training. So once you get go through initial air crew training, um, there's always, you know, you're always going up the ranks with uh, different things. So and you have your initial uh, mission training for whatever airframe you're on, and eventually you're going to uh, train to become an instructor, an evaluator for, you know, pilot, navigator, however many positions are on the airplane, they each have different levels of experience. And each of those levels has certain training requirements. So all that calculates into this equation to determine how many flying hours that base needs for the year. And then what they do is they, once they have that giant, you know, number of flying hours and all the money that, that goes with it because, um, and that money differs per airframe because each airplane costs a different amount to fly each hour. Um, like the F-22 costs more to fly to operate per hour than an F-16. So they each have a different amount. And so all that is um, given to them one October for the entire year. 
And then you have monthly uh, scheduling meetings where you roughly determine what each unit at that base, how many sorties they're going to fly each day for the entire month. And then once you break it down more in each week, um, there are weekly scheduling meetings between uh, the operators, which is the air crew members and the maintainers, and they determine what they can fly each day of the week. And that's when they get even more detailed and they assign tail numbers um, as the maintainers are, are looking and controlling the flying hours on each airframe and paying attention to when they need uh, phase, um, which is on station, um, a more in-depth inspection, when they need to go off station to depot level maintenance, um, different, different maintenance requirements on each airframe. And then they talk about configurations of the airplanes and everything like that. So all that happens every single week between Tuesday and Thursday, the ops and the maintenance folks are meeting and coordinating. Then on Friday, they have the weekly uh, scheduling contract, if you will. And that's what the wing commander signs by four o'clock on Friday. And that is, you know, it's printed. That's what you're going to fly the following week. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't, let's say, maintenance is still trying to fix a jet and they're working weekend duty trying to, to green up this jet and it doesn't happen. Well, they have spares. They can still try to, um, to do a tail number swap and change which uh, aircraft is going to fly that first uh, sortie on Monday. Or, you know, and this happens throughout the week. They can, they can do tail number swaps. Um, and then throughout the week, as things break and get fixed, or um, as they start flying, you can have flying deviations. So what these deviations are, like if, if the airplane's broke and you don't have a spare and you don't have anything to, to fly in that line that, you know, maintenance contracted with ops that they would be able to support it, then you have a, a maintenance cancel for that line. Or... Um, Let's say the air crew steps the jet, starts the jet up, and as they're running their operational checks and turning everything on, they figure they find out a particular problem, whether it's a hydraulic problem, a radar problem, um, you know, electronics of some sort. If there's an engine problem, whatever it is, if it's depending on what the problem is, they can try to fix it before canceling the line with the air crew still on the jet, and then that's what we call a red ball. That's when you're trying to fix a problem on the jet so that a uh, jet can still go fly its scheduled mission. And when you're, you know, the maintainer, the, the pro super, the expediter, you're like, you're calling up support from the back shop, whether it's, um, or you're calling in support from your own uh, aircraft maintenance unit. Like I need the, the avionics guys on tail number, whatever, because it's got this problem, or I need an engine guy on tail number, whatever, for this, this issue. And you work the problem because the air crew, they don't, they step to the airplane with a little bit of leeway in there, but you can still, even if, if you use up that leeway, you can still keep pushing to fix that jet. And then it might incur a maintenance late deviation, which means it was, the line still flew, the sortie still flew, but it was late for maintenance. Um, sometimes there are occasions where there's an ops late or an ops uh, cancel of a line. And that might be because, you know, somebody went DNIF, which is, uh, duties not to include flying. If you get sick, if you can't, uh, they'll salva and, and make your ears pop. Um, you can't go fly. And, or if you're, maybe you can still make your ears pop, but you're taking a certain medication that's not approved to, uh, take while you're flying. If somebody, um, gets COVID and then other people have close contacts and they have to quarantine. These are all reasons why the ops may not be able to support that mission they previously contracted for. So you have all these uh, flying deviations. And of course the goal is not to have flying deviations, but it sometimes happens. Um, also some other things that happen when it, uh, a jet flies and they do their mission and they come back um, and the plane has a broken system of some sort. The maintenance can uh, talk to the ops over the radio and say, okay, we're going to try to blue, blue ball that. And what that means is the jet will taxi back to its spot on the parking ramp 
and keep the engines running, air crew will stay on board and they will work with maintenance to try to fix the jet before everything shuts down. Um, it doesn't happen, happen as often. Normally they'll just taxi back to the jet, shut everything down, and in their debrief the air crew will put in the discrepancies, um, things that were wrong with the jet, and then the maintenance will have to, have to fix it before that jet next flies again. Or if it's some um, discrepancies are flyable, some are not. It just depends on what the particular problem is with the jet. So uh, let's see. And there's some, a few other discrepancies as well that can happen. Uh, higher headquarters, meaning someone high up in the Air Force, if they're they're telling you what to, what to do, what to like a certain mission to fly, um, and then they might later cancel that. That'd be a higher headquarters cancel. So there's a bunch of different deviations, but um, again, that's getting in the weeds and I'm running out of time. So uh, my husband did fly twice last week, but these deviations, he flew on Thursday when he flew, he was supposed to take off about 10 o'clock and he didn't end up taking off until um, almost seven o'clock at night. So uh, that's because they were pushing for those last few uh, sorties of the month so the guys could get their... Um, their wrap sorties because it was his third flight of the month. Um, so even though <clears throat> they only flew two hours, um, the pilots and the navigators got some of their training done. He didn't get his training done, but it still counted as a flight. So he still got his wrap for the month. So uh, just different, different things that happen trying to get all our sorties in for the month. Because if you don't fly your sorties for the entire year, then that means the next year you don't get as many flying hours. Um, so. It's like, if you don't spend your money, then they're not going to give you as much money the next time. So I hope everybody has a good stitching week. Um, do some stitching as we watch uh, how the election pans out. So uh, we'll see you later. See you later, guys. Bye.